This is Join Us in France, episode 171. This episode is brought to you in part by Patreon supporters and Addicted to France, the tour company that specializes in small group tours in France. Everybody, I'm Annie, and in today's show, I chat with Nancy Calkins about her visit to the Loire Valley. You know, the Loire Valley is geographically so close to Paris. If you don't have a lot of vacation days and you want to start exploring a little bit around the rest of France, that is a part of France that's really easy for you to get to. So learn about it a little bit and see if it's a place that sounds appealing to you. The extra content for email subscribers this week is called Chenonceau Shenanigans. And there were lots of them. It's a timeline of some of the things that happened in the days of Chenonceau's glory. And I'll talk more about that too in the bite of French history after the interview. Because hearing about it will help you appreciate the place better. And downloading the extra will will help you remember it better. Thank you to all of you who responded to the question of the week on the Join Us in France close group on Facebook. I asked you about a good tagline for Join Us in France, something that embodies what the show is all about well. The vast majority of you voted for the tagline, Voila, an insider's guide to France. I really like it. It, it kind of rolls off the tongue and I think it's accurate, don't you think? The holiday shopping season is going to start very soon. And so this is just a reminder that if you want to help out the show, you can use the Amazon affiliate link for Join Us in France. It helps pay for the file hosting uh, that lets you download the episodes, the occasional small equipment or software that I need to produce the show. And it's a win-win because you don't pay a penny more. So before you start shopping on Amazon, go to joinusinfrance.com, click on any of the Amazon logos and shop as you normally would. And thank you. I've started posting a photo of France each day on Instagram. The account is new, not a lot of followers yet, but if you like to see pictures of France, look up Addicted to France on Instagram. One of the things I like about Instagram is that there is no arguing about anything. It's just pictures. You like them, you click on the love button, you don't care, you pass right along. It's a really nice way to let your brain wander off for a minute or two and then get back to work. As you know, I have this photography habit, so it's a nice way to scratch that itch without spending too much time. So that's Addicted to France on Instagram. And now, here's the interview. Join us in France. I should say welcome back. Thank you. Thank you so much for talking to me. And today we are going to talk about your your uh, couple of days, or was it three days in the Loire Valley? We had about two. Two, mm-hmm. okay. And you were there in June 2017, so very recently. Yes. Very good. Yeah. So introduce yourself just briefly so people who just are jumping in at this episode know a little bit who you are. Sure. Um, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm Nancy, and I, uh, my husband, Ian, and my two children, Henry and Claire, we traveled to France this summer, and we went to Normandy, the Loire Valley, and Paris, and it was absolutely fantastic. Great. Yeah, and I, I asked you to talk about Normandy and Loire Valley specifically because we've had a lot of other people talk about Paris, although I might still call you back to do Paris because you did some interesting stuff there. But- I loved it there. It's it's funny that it doesn't really land on people's radar so much, but it um it was just a very beautiful, picturesque countryside just meandering along the river, the Cher River. It's just and I and the Loire, but it's it's just beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um particularly I love castles, so you know it's Ah, yeah, perfect. The world of Chateau, so that was perfect is right. Um, we started off, our first night was in a little town called Montrichard, yeah. and the 
reason we stayed there, we, you know, there are lots of beautiful places to stay. And um, it was really difficult to choose because everything's within rather close proximity to Chateau. So yeah. Um, there and there's so many, you know. There there are big ones, small ones, well known, not so well known. Mm -hmm. So choose from. But we chose Montrichard because it was a little off the beaten path. Like it, it didn't seem to be super touristy. And we were planning to go on a canoe trip, and the canoe trip left from there. Now things didn't work out, as I mentioned in my other um, conversation with you. We had a little car dilemma, so we our timing was off. Yeah, but. The canoe trip, I would highly recommend it. It looks so great. You take a canoe, you can do you can do an all-day excursion, or you can do, we were going to do a two-hour excursion where you canoe under the arches of Chenonceau. Oh, and nice. Doesn't that sound just spectacular? It, and and it, do you get on at Montrichard to do that? Yes, apparently that's where the launch point is. Ah, so, help you travel with the, you know, they, and they pick you up at the end, wherever you end up. But, um, it sounded absolutely wonderful. It was, um, it was, a, I think it was called Adventures in Canoeing. Um, and it has a website is Canoe Sur Le Cher. And, wow. um, I'll send that to you, but, yeah. um, I think that would have been great. We felt so badly that we couldn't make it. We That's where the hotel staff was really helpful in communicating in French because this gentleman spoke mostly French. But um, it looks like a really great idea. And they they also combine it with biking. You can bike and canoe. So if you're really active and have enough time, that might be a really fun thing to do as well. But mm -hmm. for us, we didn't have that time. But Montrichard turned out to be this adorable little town. It was the, we, I feel like we were the only people that weren't from Montrichard that were there. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. Yeah, it felt really good. We were it was not crowded with other people. I think there was one other German fan like a German family that was there visiting from obviously, you know, they didn't live there. Um mm -hmm. it was we stayed in a place called La Chancellerie. Yes. If I'm saying that correctly. You are. You're good at this. I'm trying. You're and good. We weren't so sure because you know, we did a lot of a lot of research online. I love trying to figure out where to stay. And I had booked a couple places. And when we decided on Montrichard, it was quirky. To say the least, it was quirky. <laughs> and the photos that we saw online, we weren't sure kind of what we were going to get, but we decided on that canoe trip. So that's where we were going to go. Mm. And it was this beautiful, I think it was like a mini chateau. I, I don't know the history of it. I don't know that the gentleman who runs it knows the history of it, but it was truly, it looked like a miniature chateau. It had the high stone walls with the um, turret type edges. We were in, we went up this circular staircase in a, in a, in a turret pretty much. Mm -hmm. And our apartment. We had a huge apartment, two bedrooms, kitchen, hallway, bath. We had our own um, suit of armor in the. In the <laughs> there was this just a full suit of armor. Um, it had a pool in the basement. Like it, it was kind of that whole the whole troglodyte part of the Loire Valley where all the caves are. The limestone. Yes. I think they're limestone caves. Um, yes. There was down there and then down in the basement in another part of the troglodyte area was a bull or pitonk playing yes. <laughs> and then we went up then he took us upstairs and showed us this game room that was this it was in the, basically in the attic of the chateau with this these beautiful wooden beam rafters and every game imaginable i mean there was roulette there was pool there was <laughs> there was a rocking horse there i mean and every game tv all sorts of stuff it was really funny there that's, i mean that's that's very quirky indeed it was awesome and you know we just didn't have enough time to enjoy all of that <laughs> yeah <laughs> We wanted to get out and see the chateau, but what a great little place. And, you know, for, for all of its quirks, what it lacked in refinement, it made up for in charm. I mean, mm -hmm. just, it was a special place. And, um, and I mentioned, I think to you in email about the, the gentleman who was the caretaker, he doesn't own it, but he's the caretaker. Uh -huh. He was so laid back and so mellow and he totally looked like a, a healthy Ozzy Osbourne. He just, <laughs> I can't explain it any other way. He looked exactly <laughs> like him, but like skinny and healthy. And he was really nice and willing to show us anything, 
help us with, you know, finding our way around town, recommending restaurants. And he was great. He was really oh, great. That's great. That's great. It sounds like, uh, you know, if they don't get a lot of tourists, that's got to be the sort of place where they're just so happy to get some visitors at all. Like they're like really excited. I think you're right. I think that's what happened. I think like, you know, it, it probably had been a while since he'd seen a tourist, you know, it was the beginning <laughs> of June, so it hadn't really picked up for the summer yet. Right. I mean, maybe the, the summer, but it was kind of, you know, I felt like he rolled out the red carpet for us. That's um, nice. there, breakfast was an option. We didn't actually end up because we were kind of going to hit the road. We didn't stay for breakfast, but they offer that as an option mm-hmm. and the red market at the, at the, little mini chateau they have a bread market there on wednesdays and so mm-hmm. we met the next gal who was doing that and it was just a really charming little place and the town itself same thing it's just small very manageable excellent we had an excellent dinner at a place called les Tufaux, and the um the gentleman who ran that restaurant was he was so great he was very conversational and charming and funny and attentive so that was really good um and we had amazing wine from cheverny mm-hmm. um as we saw later, we said we had some excellent wine there, and the there's a there's a little castle, um, another cat, you know, a Montrichard castle that they've turned into a museum. Mm-hmm. So we did do a little nighttime exploring, like you said, it's very um, light, very late. So about ten thirty at night, we were kind of got dusk at ten o'clock, and yes, uh, and went way up high to the top of this castle and this fortress that's in Montrichard and had a beautiful view over the whole valley. So it was mm. a pretty place. It was that a neat sounds place. lovely. Yeah, it seemed very small town France, and that that, that was ideal. We so probably really- good for families with kids, maybe oh not as great. Like if you're looking for a romantic chateau for a honeymoon or something, maybe not that. I don't know, you know, Mm. um, because we were only in that one room, that one apartment, um, you know, no, because it's not as upscale. It's, it's definitely, like I said, it's, it needs some refinement. Right. So, so if you're, if you're looking for a not so upscale honeymoon, maybe. Right. Yeah. Maybe not there, not for a honeymoon, but for a I think you're right. I think you're... That's, well, that's I'm thinking the, honeymoon because that's where my parents had their honeymoon is they went around visiting the Loire Valley Chateau. Uh, oh. Cal Chateau. And so my whole life I grew up, you know. That's, that's wonderful. What, that's what you do. You go visit chateaus <laughs> and you stay at various chateaus. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't get tired of them at all. They're beautiful. Yeah, and there's so, so many we, of them in that area. Well, that's just it. You know, as you're driving off to go to the big ones, we only did um, Chenonceau and Cheverny. We had talked about adding some other ones in, but timing wise, you know, we, we managed, we thought, and also the kids probably could manage two, you know? Yeah. So, um, we saw so many little ones on the way though. We're like, Oh, that maybe we should stop there. Maybe we should stop there. Yeah. There were so many to choose from. We thought Montrichard was actually a very manageable spot you know, as a central location. So if you are a family and you want to do multiple chateaux and spend a few days, that might be a good spot to be because mm-hmm. everything is accessible from there. Mm-hmm. Even mm-hmm. all the way over in Tour, it's not that far. Right. No, it's not far, far from Tour. And I was looking it up, you know, for your canoe ride, Montrichard mm-hmm. to uh, Chenonceau is about 10 kilometers. Yeah. So, yeah, it, yeah, it would yeah, it would take a couple of hours to do that if you're not, you know, a champion canoe rider <laughs> <laughs> right i mean my son is rowing now but it doesn't make all of us really yeah, good at yeah, rowing yeah yeah no that sounds like fun you know and the Loire valley has a lot of things for kids as well but you have to really dig into it and find the ones that have activities and reenactments and things like that and there are some but well um, there was one at um so we did Chenonso first, which is absolutely spectacular. You know, there's nothing like that on the water. And I loved the history of the the rivalry between the women, between <laughs> Catherine de Medici and, um, oh, now I'm not going to remember her name, uh, Poitiers de Poitiers. Yes, yes. I just find that hilarious. Like she, <laughs> de Medici put her portrait in the room that was Diane de Poitiers, you know, like she <laughs> had the last word. She put her own portrait up in the mistress's room there and you go. 
she built her garden to rival the other and building on her bridge. And you know, it just, it's funny. That, it must have been that. really hard to be a woman in those days because, you know, and they had to put up with a lot of shenanigans. I don't know. I don't know if I would have liked it that much, most personally, but, but the chateaus are beautiful. <laughs> but it was expected that they'd have multiple mistresses, you know, and they, and yeah. they get these giant, he gives her a giant chateau. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's an yes. interesting Glad we're alive now. Um, so, it, so, and it was absolutely beautiful, just as I remembered. And the and the the other thing that was beautiful at Chenonceau that they do so well are the floral arrangements. And I'm not I'm not an expert at that at all, but they are exquisite. They yeah, they do have a lot of them. Oh my goodness, they're beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But then we went to Cheverny, and um, that is a a smaller chateau. It's pretty well known though, and that is the um, as you and probably a lot of your listeners know that it's the base for or the basis for Captain Haddock's mansion in the Tintin books. Oh, so it's it's based on that. <laughs> Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. I mean, I know Captain Haddock, obviously, but I didn't know that it was there. Yes, I, that's if you take the two ends, if you look at the chateau, you know, head on, if you take the two end buildings, the two end wings off, you will see Captain Haddock's mansion. That is it exactly. Oh, wow. So that's the basis for it. And they've now put in a tin tin exhibit in. Uh, on a, in a side building um, at the chateau, and the kids loved it. Now, mine are a little bit older for it, but they loved it. It's like a complete. Um, it's very. It's interactive. We saw some younger kids who were just having a ball. They had such a good time in there. Um, so that is designed very specifically for kids, and it's fun. And it's very well done. That's great. That's yep. good. That's that, good. and then the hunting dogs. I mean, yes, the kids and hunting dogs wrong with that either um and they were all out just lounging i sent a picture to you so maybe you'll be able to put yes i might use it yes they're piled on top of each other i mean two there are 200 of them and i think all they had done that day i don't think that they had been on a hunt but they had had breakfast like two pounds of meat or something Mm -hmm. and they're just all lounging, lying literally on top of one another right so they're they're a hound they're kind of hound breed um, yes, they're. A, I think they're a uh, foxhound, maybe some sort of French foxhound, but they are beautiful. Oh my goodness, mm-hmm. they're beautiful. Very cool. Yes, yeah, so, so they're kind of tall on their legs. Yes, they are. They're, so the kids, that I mean, if you want a kid-oriented chateau, um, Cheverny definitely has has the dogs and has the Tintin exhibit. Plus, mm-hmm. the chateau itself is beautiful. That's really good. And the to ground. Know. Yeah, the grounds are great. Um, we loved it. We definitely, you know, that was worth it. And there's a vineyard, not a vineyard, but there's a little wine tasting. And I don't know if I heard about it through you um, in a podcast, but there's a little wine tasting just outside the the front gate of Cheverny. Mm. And it's fantastic. You go in, there are, she's got a hundred different wines from Cheverny and you can do a tasting. And it was it was perfect. It was great for the adults. <laughs> After the <laughs> that's right, that's dish, right. <laughs> and the kids are you know moaning and rolling their eyes. They're like, just relax. This is our turn. Just so be a few minutes. Yeah, we did Tintin for you. So come on in here. And it was lovely. It was perfect. And she was very knowledgeable about the wine. So they have the whole same thing that I think the Tuscan wines have where you have to have a, you get certified in a certain way. And you've done this on your wine shows. I think you've talked about the different, um, the different requirements. Types of wines, yes. Yeah. So um, this is one of the areas and, and what the Cheverny follows along with a lot of those guidelines. Yeah. It's an AOC and, the, and all that. Yeah. It, exactly. And the wine yeah. was good. It was very good. Oh yeah. So, I would go back to the Loire for sure. I think that I wouldn't mind doing some biking, seeing more of the troglodytes, seeing a few more chateaux. It's just so pretty to be along that sleepy river and it's green and every building is beautiful. Yeah. I mean, well, and people have to understand that in the Loire Valley, it's, it's, there are several rivers and there are chateaus along all of those rivers. Yes. You know, yeah, la Loire. So there's a Loire River. There's a Cher, uh, le Cher. Mm-hmm. Um, there's probably others. 
that have re that have let's see la loire le cher oh maybe not those are the two big ones right yeah the yeah yeah, yeah. there might be I like mean, it, yeah there might be it's others. just it's beautiful yeah it's a beautiful area i must i must admit it's and and there are so many chateaus that you can find some that are not really that you know touristy if that's what you're looking for and if you just want to see the big the, you know Cheverny and Chenonceau are obviously like fantastic uh -oh. all yes. right yes it's it worth it thank you so much i think we uh, we have uh, we have uh, explored that area Quite well. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. Uh, and, uh, well, who knows? I might have you on again to talk about Paris because you had some fun adventures in Paris as well. Did. We did. It, there's <laughs> so much. It's so great. Yes. Merci beaucoup, Nancy. Merci. Thank you. Uh, au revoir. Take care. Thank you for signing up to support Join Us in France on Patreon this week. Janet Adeletti. My thanks also to all the patrons who support the show month after month. I want you to know how much I appreciate your continued support. To join Janet and all the other patrons, go to patreon.com and search for Join Us in France. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And thank you for tipping your guide, Dolores Pausi and Michael Grove. Dolores and Michael went to joinusinfrance.com and clicked on the tip your guide button. Your donation lets me know that you find the show valuable and I love being reminded of that once in a while. And now for my personal update. Well, as you know, I started this podcast because I was looking for two things. One, I wanted to master a new technical skill, which was how to produce a podcast. Mission accomplished. I rarely mess things up too much anymore. And the response to the podcast has been positive from the start. And well over a half a million downloads later, it is still going and will continue to go. The listenership is engaged and friendly, and it's great. I really enjoy doing it. My second goal in starting this podcast was to get to know my own country, France, which I left as a young adult and I didn't come back to until I turned 40. Well, mission accomplished there too. I know this country a lot better than I used to, and it's, it's really a great source of joy for me. But because of the way this show started, which was organically without any strategy whatsoever, the episodes were added in a hodgepodge way, the site was thrown together without any structure, and besides, I also had to learn how to put together and maintain a site. I've learned a lot in the meantime, but <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes too. As a result, joinusinfrance.com is chock full of great information, but these great nuggets of information are really difficult to find. So a third goal for me, which is not achieved yet, is to get this site organized. I'm working on it. A fourth goal for me has been to write some books as companion material to the podcast, but I've never really buckled down long enough to make it to make it happen. I mean, I've started several books, but never finished any. So I decided to commit to do NaNoWriMo this November, it's the whole month of November, and complete my first book, which is going to be a summary of the great lessons learned from the collective wisdom of the Join Us in France community. I haven't decided on a name yet, but I'll let you know soon. May, I'll probably poll you and ask you what you think. My goal is to finish one book. It probably won't be a super long book because the point of the book is going to help solve one big problem for the reader. What do you need to know to have a great vacation in France? What are the few things that are vital? And, and, and where do you start to make sense of France uh, and how things work here? I've got the outline and I'm starting today on the day this podcast releases. So it's going to be a full month of November, but I'm doing this full time in November. I'm going to give it a serious effort and see where it leads me. And I will do my best to produce a new episode every week and spend a little time on Facebook group, on the Facebook group too, and do some other things. But I really want to concentrate on the writing. 
I'm releasing this episode the day after Halloween. I hope you all had a great time with your celebrations. We had a group Halloween party at the, in the park in Toulouse. Uh, it was last Sunday. It was organized by a group called Americans in Toulouse. Lots of people came and... It was great to see the reaction from French people to, to all these costumed people. They were cute. Some French kids just had to come hug my husband. He was wearing a Tigger costume. You know, one of the nice looking Tigger costumes that the Disney company puts out. And he had an orange face and everything. The kids just loved it. <laughs> like There was this four-year-old kind of age range where they were like, Oh, my hero. <laughs> It was it was really fun. It was really fun. Having uh, gatherings like that in a public place is not a super French thing, but there were smiles all around. Everybody liked it. Ooh, and I almost forgot, but I have to tell you also that as a result of the poll for the t-shirt design, which I haven't put anything together yet, I will... That's part of the things I need to do in November. I asked my husband to help me redesign the logo a little bit so it shows the 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 name of the title of the show so it says the join us in france travel podcast around the uh, logo and so if you want to see it on your podcasting app that's the one that should appear this time so take a look at that and i think it's it's a lot better and thank you to my husband for doing that because i didn't know how and i didn't really want to learn how but he knew so it was cool The best way to connect with me is to email me, annie at joinusinfrance.com or search for the Join Us in France closed group on Facebook or Addicted to France on Instagram. And if you have a tidbit to share with the Join Us in France community, something that you think everybody should know about, call the voicemail line. It's 1-801-806-1015. Leave a voicemail, I'll play it on the podcast. Share all the good stuff that you know with all the listeners. All right, let's talk about Chenonceau and do our bite of French history. When you go to Chenonceau, you will probably hear the term le château des dames, the ladies' castle, because women were at the center of its construction and history and of a lot of the shenanigans that happened there, which is the email extra. Today, I'm going to tell you about three of them. There are many more, but we have to keep it simple. Noble woman Catherine Brissonnet was the architect and the general contractor for the Chateau de Chenonceau. Construction began in 1513. There was another chateau there before, but they didn't preserve most of it. Catherine's husband was rich because he was a tax collector, and she was full of brilliant ideas. At one point, he had to go off to war in Italy, and she made lots of exquisite architectural decisions, managed the construction, and had the letters TBK engraved. That stands for Thomas Boyer and Catherine, with a K. That was her name. But alas, Thomas never came back from Italy, where he died in battle. And I'm not sure why she died herself, but two years later, she also died. And so Chenonceau then passes into the hands of their son, Antoine. Very nice inheritance, Antoine. (laughs) But that didn't last long either. It turns out that daddy, the tax collector, who had died in battle in Italy, had cooked the books. He had stolen a lot of money, and King François I, François I, imposed a hefty fine on his descendants. So Antoine had to pay up, but he didn't have the cash. So he turned the chateau over to the king in 1533. So Chenonceau now belongs to the king, and it gets... And because of that, it gets the title of Résidence Royale, which means Royal Residence. But François Ier didn't do so much with Chenonceau for a long time. He had other chateaux to worry about, such as Chambord, you know, Chambord, just tiny little thing, and Fontainebleau and several others. So he didn't really stay at Chenonceau until, until 1455. But then when he did stay, he was like, oh, this is cool. And oh, and the hunt is really good around here. You know, great. So he, he wanted to come. But unfortunately, 
François Ier died soon after his first visit to Chenonceau at the fairly young age of 53. So he didn't get to enjoy it for very long either. Now, I'm going to tell you how he died because it's truly horrifying. <laughs> This stuff is creepy, and this is the day after Halloween, so it's okay. But if you're having lunch or have sensitive ears or little children with you, you might want to skip 30 seconds because it's really gross and tasteless. But I love to read about this stuff, and I have to share it because it kind of made me laugh. Well, I didn't... Well, yeah, it made me laugh, okay. (laughs) In the last few years of his life, the dear king... François Ier developed an unfortunate medical problem. This medical problem can happen today, but this is the stuff a proctologist can fix before it gets out of hand, which is really what you want to do. Are you getting a hint of what part of the body I'm going to here? But this is 1535, and that stuff killed you with a horrible, slow death. François Ier developed a fistula, a fistula is an opening when there, where there is not supposed to be one. I'm not a doctor, but I think, you know, that's what I get. Like, there was something open that wasn't supposed to. And this fistula was between his anus and his testicles? Yeah, let that sink in for a second. Now, uh, maybe riding horses didn't help the matter much, but I think it could happen to anyone. Anyway... The dear man had fecal matter where it didn't belong, and that gave him permanent infections, constant fevers, gonads the size of Manhattan Island, and a host of other unfortunate side effects. (laughs) The infection got into his kidneys, and they wrote in his autopsy that the kidney failure is what killed him. I'm sure death was a relief at that point, because this dragged on for three years. Oh, but back to our women. Women can't have this problem, right? I I don't think so. (laughs) Not in the same place anyway. All right, I'll let it go. But but this is truly disturbing. But I'll let it go because I have another gruesome death to tell you about in a moment. The second important woman in Chenonceau's history was Diane de Poitiers. You have heard this name, I am sure. She was another noble woman, a lifelong friend and lover of Henry II, who became the king after the unfortunate François I passed. And she... Diane de Poitiers, was a woman who wielded a lot of power by virtue of her emotional influence over the king. Henry II was extremely fond of her and spent a lot of time with her in public. Their affair was a secret to no one. She was really smart, too. She often wrote official letters for him because she was better at it than he was. Now, the king's wife, Catherine de Médicis, she never was given any such role. The queen, they kept very, very carefully separated from power because they were always afraid that the queen might get too popular and might take over. But a mistress, she was fine and she was smart. So within three months of Henry II becoming the new king, she received Chenonceau as a gift. When you go, think of that. Her lover, I guess she was the mistress, so does that mean he was the mantress? No, that, that, that word doesn't exist, does it? <laughs> her lover uh, gave her Chenonceau, of all things. I mean, wow. Henry II, the king's actual wife, Catherine de Médicis, she wanted this chateau, but no, he gave it to the mistress, to Diane. Diane de Poitiers commissioned several enhancements uh, to Chenonceau, particularly for the gardens. And you can still see the gardens when you visit now. And in the spring, in good weather, the gardens at Chenonceau are exquisite. I mean, it's Versailles-style gorgeous. There, there's a labyrinth. Um, it's, it's beautiful. I went in the winter, so I didn't get the full effect. But I'm hoping to do this again in the spring uh, soon. In 1552... 
five years after she took possession of Chenonceau, Diane de Poitiers threw a big party at this beautiful castle. She hosted her lover, Henry II, his wife, Marie de Médicis, and most of the court at Chenonceau for the first time. It must have been really grand and really awkward because can you imagine? Come visit me in this gorgeous chateau you gave me over your wife's wishes and bring her as well, you know, yay. Yeah, that was really awkward. So, as you can imagine, Catherine de Médicis, the queen, hated her rival, Diane de Poitiers, the mistress, and when Henry II died in a terrible accident at age 40, the wife took revenge. Let me t I'll tell you about the revenge in a second, but we've come to the second gruesome death in this episode. It's not as gross as the last one, but just as painful. In June 1559, King Henry II participated in a jousting tournament. Think American football, just a lot more violent, with weapons that can actually kill people. They still did that sort of thing to show how manly they were. Henry II was pretty good at it, too. He defeated several opponents. Well, I mean, maybe the opponents let him win. We don't know. He was the king, after all. But... That day, Henry II jousted against a young count from Scotland called Montgomery. This young kid almost knocked him off his horse. So the king insisted on having another crack at beating up the kid, right? Yeah, it didn't quite happen the way he was hoping. This time, the young Montgomery landed a long wooden lance right in the king's face, lifting the protective visor, and the lance pretty much destroyed the king's face. He died 10 days later at age 40. There were no surgeons or antibiotics in 1547, but even today, I'm not sure you would, le you would survive that level of injury. It was truly gruesome. Anyway, now Catherine de Médicis is a young widow. And she can get rid of that Diane de Poitiers. What do you do when you're the queen and your husband has affairs left and right? Because, of course, Diane wasn't his only mistress. Well, Catherine de Médicis fell back on customs of royalty. Mistresses and their children were not allowed to attend the funeral. Whereas... Diane was sitting right next to the queen when he got his face destroyed by that lance. So, yeah. But she wasn't allowed to come to the, um, to the funeral. She wasn't ever allowed to come back to court. And it was also customary that mistresses had to give back any jewels that the king had given her. And she did that. But what about Chenonceau? At first, it seemed Catherine would let it go, but eventually she took it back. Or rather, she exchanged it for another chateau, which is kind of a class act, if you ask me. Diane de Poitiers received the chateau de Chaumont-sur-Loire in exchange for Chenonceau. So I looked up Chaumont-sur-Loire because I thought it would be a dump, right? I mean, if you wanted to be mean to your... Anyway, no, it's not a dump at all. Chaumont-sur-Loire is gorgeous. It's very different in style than Chenonceau, but really, really gorgeous. You should look it up. I'll put, I'll put a picture on the website so you can see it. After the death of uh, Henry II, France entered a period of terrible turmoil. Catherine de Médicis' son became the new king. He is known as François II. But he's really not famous at all because he was only age 15 when he became the king and he died a few months later. It looks like meningitis killed him. So not, well, it's awful, but it's not gruesome. Too bad. <laughs> but he made a lot of stupid decisions in a short time uh, that led to many problems later on. You know, what do you know? You shouldn't give power, that much power, to a 15-year-old. Like, yeah. Mm. But that's how royalty worked. After short-lived François II, his younger brother became the king, known as Charles IX, Charles IX. And he was only 10 when his brother died. So he couldn't take power just yet. His mother, Catherine de Médicis, was the regent. 
And that's when the wars of religion came into full swing. The 15-year-old king got them off to a great start because he was really stupid. And now that they are a thing, they will come back every few years. It's, it was awful. The regent's heart, so Catherine de Medicis, her heart was probably in the right place. She was a good negotiator and a compromiser, and she, I don't think she had any ill will towards the Protestants. But she was also really tone deaf to the realities of life in France in the 1500s. And so were the rest of the nobles, really. Catherine de Medicis spent lavishly on Chenonceau. She had big plans, some of them so big that they never came, became a reality because she ran out of cash eventually. But when you visit Chenonceau, they will probably tell you all the details of what queen or what mistress added what and all of that. And it's, it's interesting to see that. But what they might not tell you, which I think is really important, and you can't tell by looking at the place because it's so gorgeous and bucolic and tranquil today, you know. But what they can't tell you, what they don't usually tell you is how much suffering there was going on in the country when, uh, when the chateau was in full swing. Uh, there were wars, there was the plague, they had bad harvests, the Protestants, the wars of religion. It was uh, really, really bad for the people. And in the meantime, Catherine de Médicis is planning new gardens at Chenonceau. She did try to avoid some of the massacres, but she didn't succeed. So her son, King Charles IX, who came to power at age 10, he also died young, at age 23. So he didn't rule by himself for very long, but he was really good at throwing oil on the fire, and things got from bad to worse under his reign. Like I said... Charles IX died young without a male heir, and he was so bad at his job that everybody assumed he had been poisoned. But no, it would appear that uh, it's pneumonia that got him. Again, not that gruesome. But at 23, dying in pneumonia at 23, maybe it was best because he was really bad at his job. Anyway, so who will be the next king? That's Henry III. He was the third son of Catherine de Médicis, that became a French king. And he was so far down the inheritance ladder that he didn't, he didn't live in France when, this, when his brother died. He had claimed the throne in Poland, where he, was known, where he is known as Henrik Walesi, king of Poland and grand duke of Lithuania. But when he heard that he could now inherit the throne in France. He skedaddled out of Poland and came back to France to rule as Henry III. And when he came back to France, they weren't so sure that he was legitimate and the wars of religion were still going on. The economy is in shambles, but he's not as dumb as his brothers. And so he, he was able to rally people to his cause. He married a woman called Louise de Lorraine Vaudemont, that you will probably hear about at also because she played an important part too. But I'll let them tell you the rest of the story when you visit. When you look into all of these things, is it any wonder that the French Revolution happened? As ill-conceived as it was, the French Revolution had its roots in the fundamental inaptitude and tone deafness of the rulers who had come before. But look on the bright side. France now has amazing chateaux, a lot of them in the Loire Valley. And, well, at least we got something to show for the lavish spending and the crazy kings and queens and their shenanigans. So I say, go visit Trinonso. It's amazing in every way. This is the French tip of the week. For the French tip of the week today, I'm going to teach you how to say one thing that you can use to say many things. That sentence is, Où se trouve la station service la plus proche, s'il vous plaît? Où se trouve la station service la plus proche, s'il vous plaît? So where is the nearest gas station, please? 
And if you go to Shonoso, you will probably go by car, although you don't have to, have to. And you might need to get fill up with gas. Où se trouve la station service la plus proche, s'il vous plaît? And you can use this construction to say many things. Où se trouvent les toilettes les plus proches, s'il vous plaît? Where the nearest bathrooms? Où se trouve le café le plus proche, s'il vous plaît? Where's the nearest café? Où se trouve le parking le plus proche, s'il vous plaît? Where's the nearest parking lot? See what I mean? Où se trouve le ou la ou les, depending on what it is, la plus proche, s'il vous plaît? That's it. That'll do it for you. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful week. And I'll talk to you next Wednesday. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2017 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.